Sunday, the 3rd of September 1939, the Second World War was declared. Tyneside played a major role in the country's war effort. It was at the hub of the nation's shipbuilding, coal and munitions production. It had the major arms manufacture, Vickers on Scotswood Road, the great shipyards on both banks of the Tyne, including Hawthorne Leslie, Smith Stocks, Swan Hunters, Redheads, and collieries that ran near the Tyne. The rising sun at War's End, Bold and Hart, and Wardley and Hewith. Tyne shipyards replaced half of the four million tons of shipping lost during the war. It was a key centre of industry, and as such, was a target for the Luftwaffe. My cousin Anne, who was about three or four year old, used to insist on being taken outside to look at the stars in the middle of bombs dropping all around and German planes overhead. This child would have to be taken to the door of the shelter and shown the stars to stop her crying. We're all in the air raid shelter, all sitting there and um, the bombs were coming down of course and everybody's, everybody's cringing and ducking from the, the bomb blasts where I'm rubbing my hands thinking well if this air raid goes on after three o'clock I won't have to go to school if it stays this side of three o'clock I'll have to go to school. My parents at that time lived in Elna Street one of the planes which I believe came down according to my parents in, in one of the parks but on its way, it jettisoned two or three 500 pound bombs and you know, it did an awful lot of damage. The last bomb of the raid was a whoosh and then a shh, louder and louder, louder than I'd ever heard this before. And then, bam, the walls of the shelter shook, shelter shook the ceiling shook, the bits of dust came down. The candle went out, I think the candle fell off its little rack, and then the old clear went. So we clambered out the back door, forced the back door open because there was stones in front, got in the back door of the house because the, 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 the air raid shelter was actually in the backyard, and we went through the house, through the kitchen, living room, along, along the passage, and as we opened the passage door, a big wall of dust came along the passage. When we finally got to the front door, the front door was leaning in off its hinges and the um, outside where there'd been houses there was now a hole, a very large hole and six houses had gone and we went into our front room and on the mantelpiece in the front room um, there were two bisque ornaments, very very delicate, my grandmother's pride and joy and um, she was really sort of horrified. Oh my God, my, my ornaments. And she went, and I immediately went out in the street and to see what had happened, of course, as kids do. And it was a bomb crater, and it bombed our street, finally, after the, you know, the war was nearly finished, or the air raids were nearly finished. And um, I went back in, and my grandma was clutching the ornaments, saying they were all right except the lady that Hitler had broken the little loop off the strap. Now you can just see where there should be a little strap. And this forlorn little figure survived the war. And um, I went on the Antiques Roadshow with this, and it was hilarious, and I was showing them a picture of the, the bomb crater and the bombing, which was a horrifying, you know. And um, he said he, he valued them, which wasn't very much. And then he said, well, he said, you know why it survived, don't you? I said, I have no idea. He says, well, he said, uh, the made in Germany. He said, if you look at the bottom, he says, if you look, he says, you'll see the maker's mark for Germany. I was at the Glebe Church and the siren went. So my friend Jean and I decided we would run home, which was home was... Hyde Street, just a short distance from the church. So we ran and went into our respective homes. And my parents said we were going to the shelter. And my neighbour called out to me, did I have anything to read? 
So I ran round into my neighbour's shelter and the man of the house moved to let me sit down and then the bomb started to fall and I was blown out of that doorway. My mum and dad, who I love dearly, were killed. My dad was found later that night and died, but my mum didn't survive at all. That was a, a day, a night, that I'll never, ever forget. school and the teachers were trying to persuade everybody to put their name down to go on evacuation but I didn't want to go leave my mum I was the only daughter just had a brother and uh, but my friends were all going so I said oh yes I'll go we gave, they gave her a week to get with the give her a list which my mother had a job getting because you had to use coupons and I had to have new pyjamas, new jumper, skirts, shoes, wellies, slippers. And the case had to be full of all these new things. But then when it came to the part that I had to go, I wouldn't go. Uh, I started crying. I said, oh, I don't want to go. So she took us home. My dad was a grocer and food started to get much scarcer, you got your ration book and you had to abide by that. During the war when there were a lot of shortages, my granddad, who loved peas pudding, found out there was some available in Ferry Street in Jarrah. Now he lived in Nixon Street, which was two or three streets away, and he sent me Aunt Joyce, who was his youngest daughter, to go and get a bowl of this peas pudding. <laughs> well, she got the peas pudding, and on the way back, she was just crossing that little cobbled square in front of the Empire uh, Film House uh, when uh, a dogfight broke out overhead. Uh, a German plane was being attacked by uh, Spitfire, and the two of them were swirling about and uh, opened fire, and of course in fear, because the bullets flew over her head, she threw herself down onto the cobbles and the peas pudding went flying amongst all of the, all of the horse muck and everything onto the cob cobbles. So that was the finish of me granddad's peas pudding. People ask, were you hungry during the war? But we weren't because the rations were enough for us. And, and again, if we run short of butter or sugar, some of these people in the street with big families would sell you their coupons and take it to the corner shop and she'd give you their butter and sugar, cheese, meat. And I think in those days everybody took two and three spoonfuls of sugar in their tea, so sugar was a very precious commodity. And my mother said a cup of tea had got knocked over into the sugar bowl and they were so concerned that they actually dried the sugar out on top of the stove so they could use it again. There were cues for anything which wasn't rationed. And then of course sweets got on to ration and you were very lucky if a, a shop had a bar of chocolate in. And in Robert Westall's novel The Machine Gunners, the central character Chas McGill loved to collect shrapnel. For some children the war was exciting. And we would collect shrapnel, bits of bombs, of course, really, it was called looting. We used to go around in the morning after the air raids had been. That was our uh, pastime, all the young ones, hunting for bits of shrapnel in the streets. And we all had a team and collected the bits of shrapnel, see who got the most bits of bombs and bits of aeroplane and that. And the things that we, things that we picked up off the, off the streets, the, the bomb streets, all presumably it belonged to somebody. We had photographs, we had little ornaments, 
and it was stealing but we didn't know so a lot of my time was spent running away from long-legged policemen my other grandmother lived in Thornton Avenue just beside the dock gates and of course there was lots of bombing raids during th that time. Under the cover of the bombing the dockers would often liberate various items from the docks, climb over the wall with them and stash them in my grandmother's house and usually as a reward she might get a bottle of whiskey or something similar. A plane flew very close overhead, on fire. It crashed at the right hand side at the bottom of Beach Road and it blew up, killed the fireman killed the airmen, blew down the, um, the, the building that houses the little boats, the little yachts, and um, just created mayhem. If you could grapple in the lake with bent coat hangers and pull something out with a, a German writing on, this was, this was a swappable article. And I pulled out a flying boot. I've got a flying boot, I shouted. So they all came running along. Hey, that's great, let's have work. And then I put my hand inside the flying boot, hand, I point out, and pulled out what appeared to be cooked tripe, this wobbling, jellified, whitey, creamy skin. And of course, it was the poor man's boot, it was his foot that had been blown off. You'll never do any swaps with that, it'll stink, chuck it back in. So I threw it back in the lake. The radio was a great source of information during the war, but the Germans also used it for propaganda purposes. And there was a broadcaster called Lord Haw Haw, who used to particularly um, home in when there'd been a raid the night before. And on one occasion he was talking about South Shields and he was talking about people in the ruins of the houses starving to death. Well, just at that point, my grandma was dishing up stew. So she thrust a plate of stew in front of the radio and shouted, have a smell of that, you bugger. 